the Harbor Freight Predator 3500 Inverter Generator. Let's talk about it. Now, right off the bat, what is an inverter generator? And why would I choose one of those over a just regular generator? The short answer is this. An inverter generator basically creates much cleaner power for sensitive electronics. The slightly longer answer is that an inverter generator basically generates AC current, converts that to DC current, and then as the name implies, it inverts it back to AC current. The reason for this is specifically to create cleaner power. A standard open frame style generator that's not an inverter generator produces what they call dirty power. This is essentially AC current, like what comes out of your wall, but it's not really stable. It can have spikes and those spikes can actually affect your sensitive electronics like computers. So that's where inverter generators come in, just much cleaner power. Now there is a catch and you've probably guessed it. The catch is that inverter generators are more expensive, but thankfully we have a store called Hard Harbor Freight. And this version is directly from Harbor Freight and it costs about that $700 range depending on whether you get it on sale or not. So if you want a generator that's going to produce really clean power so you can power things like computers, you're going to want an inverter generator. This version from Harbor Freight is called the Predator 3500. And if we look really close, you can see the 3500 stands for the maximum starting watts, but it's actually 3000 running watts. And that's another thing you need to pay attention to when it comes to generators. Even though this is called the Predator 3500, which might make you think that it's 3500 running watts, that 3500 actually stands for maximum starting watts. So that's like if you have an appliance, like for example, an air conditioner, in an RV, when it first kicks on and starts up, it's gonna pull more wattage than when it's actually running. Okay, now inverter generators also have some extra benefits. Number one, they're usually smaller and designed in this closed frame design, meaning it's just like one solid looking brick. Number two, they are usually more fuel efficient. And that's because they have the ability to automatically throttle themselves up and down depending on the demand. In this case, we have this ESC throttle and I can turn it on or keep it off. But when it's off, this generator runs at full speed all the time. So when that switch is engaged in the on position, this generator will only run as much as it needs to. Now, because of that throttling, these inverter generators are usually much more quiet than a typical non-inverter generator, which is awesome. Okay, so after that quick lesson on inverter generators, why did I buy this one? Well, here in Middle Tennessee, we recently had a pretty large tornado. And with that tornado, we lost power for a few days. Now, losing power is obviously never fun, but just a few days before, I filled my meat freezer and I didn't want to lose all that meat. So I found myself with a problem. I needed a generator and I needed it immediately. Directly after that tornado hit, I thought, you know what? I better go get a generator as soon as possible. And not really knowing just how bad the damage was, I headed out to Harbor Freight to buy this generator. Thankfully, they had a few in stock and I'm talking about an hour after the tornado hit. Now, I've been wanting a generator for some time and actually have done some research recently. And with that research, of course, I came across this generator and a lot of people really like them. I've seen videos on these with a ton of hours and people saying that they basically never change the oil, run the heck out of them, and they still run great. So in that situation where I'm having to make a quick decision as to which type of generator to buy? Do I get an inverter generator or a normal one? How many watts do I need? I kind of went for the middle ground. Now there is another step up from this that was a few hundred more dollars, which is the Predator 5000, and I was about to get that. However, I knew I kind of wanted the generator to be portable, somewhat. I still needed the power though, because I had to power at least my meat freezer, if not more than that. So just reading some of the specs and going off of the research that I have previously done, I settled quickly on the Predator 3500 and I think it was a good choice. So far, I have about 15 hours on this machine. Now, one thing to note, if you just bought this generator, you must fill it with oil and of course gasoline. These generators do not come with oil in them, so you have to fill it with oil first. Looking at the side here with the pull handle, you can see we also have this oil fill access door. You do need a flathead screwdriver in order to turn that little screw in there, and that door comes right down and pulls out. Looking deeper inside, you can see the oil fill cap. Now this is where you're gonna actually fill the oil. And then this tube that's kind of bent over to the side, 
is the oil drain port. This is where we're gonna drain our oil from. Now in the box, you do get some goodies. The manual, a funnel, tool for the spark plug. You get a little flathead screwdriver in there and some other things. There's also this 30 amp twist lock RV adapter in a bag here. And also what's really handy is this quick start guide here. Although I do feel like the start guide on how to start this thing shouldn't be right here on the front. What should be on the front is this Predator setup guide, which tells you how to add fuel and also how to fill it with oil. Okay, so what type of oil do we use? Well, right here in the owner's manual on the back of the first page, we see our specifications. Now, if you come down to engine oil, you can see type SAE 10W30, and the capacity is 20 ounces. Now for fuel, they say 87 plus octane, with stabilizer in it. Now, one thing I do wanna note about how much oil to put in, you can see on this graphic here, when your machine is on a level surface and you're filling it up with oil, it should basically come up to the tip of the threads there as shown on the graphic. Now let's go ahead and see what mine looks like. Hopefully we're on a level surface here and I don't get any spilling out. There, you can look really close and see that that oil is right there on the tip of the threads, exactly like that graphic showed. There's also a little dipstick here on the end of this cap, but I feel like if you just pay attention to those threads and you still have oil to those threads, then you have enough oil. Since we looked at that oil fill cap, let's look at the oil drain port. Now this is something that I feel like could have been better. I just took this out and the cap fell right off. Now let me show you how loose this is. I'm barely gonna turn this, you can see just how easily that comes off and oil can come out. So it's just a very simple turn there. And this cap, it's a quarter turn, this thing falls right off and you can see the oil's ready to pour out. So my point here is that if you go and change the oil or what have you and flip this thing back in, you better make sure that this cap is still on there and didn't somehow come untwisted and all your oil is gonna pour out in there causing the engine to lose all the oil and potentially cause catastrophic damage. So how often do we check the oil levels and how often do we need to change the oil? Well, number one, you should check the oil levels every time you go to use this thing. It's always good practice just to pop this cover off, make sure you have oil in it because sometimes these things burn oil and the oil level could be really low. And as for changing the oil, if we look at this service guide, we can see the check mark right there at the six month, 100 hour mark. And it says change engine oil, check and clean spark plug, check and clean spark arrestor. And in the actual manual here, it also does say to change the engine oil every six months or 100 hours of use. Now, if you guys know me here on One Road, I never follow directions in that regard. I'm gonna be changing this oil right now in this video with just 15 hours of use, and there's a reason. But I will tell you that reason a little bit later. For now, let's get this cover back on. You just slip those little tabs right into their spaces there put that door right where it goes and use your screwdriver to put the lock back in place. Okay, checking the fuel level, I am a little low, but for this video, this will be fine. Now, how do we start this thing? Well, right here on the start guide, let's follow the directions. Number one, it says turn the ESC throttle to off. Okay, yep, mine is off. Number two, turn the switch to start for a cold engine or just to run for a warm engine. Okay, here's our dial here. We can see the first position is run or restart. This is if you've had it running, the engine is already warmed up and you just need to restart it again. You're gonna put that right there. Now down here, you can see start or choke. This is where we're gonna start it if the engine hasn't been running a while and is you know the same temperature as outside. So that's a cold engine. We're gonna turn this dial right here to the choke position and you can feel it kind of stop right there. So that's gonna stop at that position. Number three, we're either gonna push the button to start because this does have a push button starter or pull the starter handle. Now there is a panel right here and down here it says connect battery inside. And I simply haven't done that yet. So I've just been pulling the handle to start it, which works just fine. So after we pull the handle and we see this output light light up, which should be a green light right here. Step five here says we're then gonna slowly turn the switch to run before attaching loads. So again, we're starting it in this choke position. We're gonna see a little green output light there and then we're immediately gonna move this switch up into the run position. Let's give it a shot. Okay. I'm gonna turn it to run even though I didn't see that green light because it was started and I could hear it putting around. So as soon as I turned it to run, you heard it kind of kick in 
and now we have a green light on the output. So not exactly as the directions showed that we're first gonna see the green light, then we're gonna switch it to run. I've noticed that anytime I start it, it kinda, you pull it, it kinda putters, you switch it over to, to run, and immediately it just fires right up. Okay, now this is what this thing sounds like, and this is full throttle because that throttle control switch is turned off. I'm about maybe five to six feet from the machine, and I have a lavalier mic, but we'll listen to both the sound from the lavalier and from the iPhone. Again, now five to six feet from the actual exhaust. And now I'm maybe 20 to 25 feet away from the machine, not too far, but this is what it sounds like on the lavalier mic. And on the iPhone. So in my opinion, this machine is very, very quiet. Now, if I go ahead and switch on the ESC throttle. You can hear how it throttled way down and it got a lot more quiet. And this is back at that original farther position, 20 to 25 feet away. Let's hear what it sounds like with the ESC throttle switch engaged and the machine throttled down. Pretty darn quiet. I mean, it is very quiet. Okay, let's go ahead and turn this thing off. First, I'm gonna take the ESC throttle off. Then, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the dial to off. That's it. It's now the next day, so this machine is totally cooled off. Everything is cold. I'm gonna do an oil change, the first oil change on this thing. And that's because, well, at 15 hours, you know, all brand new engines do have a break-in period. This does not have an oil filter like a vehicle's engine. So even though it only has 15 hours on it and the oil I used is full synthetic, I still wanna do my initial oil change just to try to get some of that metal material from the break-in of the engine out. I wanna give this thing the best possible chance it has to live the longest life it can. And there goes that oil cap again. This could be a problem. I have an empty water bottle here and my attempt is going to be to drain all the oil out into this water bottle so we can see the color, so we can see if there's anything floating in there or not floating as in metal shavings. So here's this cap that's very simple to remove. Now the other issue I see is that this tube is obviously ramping up here. There's no real way of getting that down below the actual drain port on the engine without tilting this machine. I don't see another way of doing it. So while some of the oil is draining out, I'm gonna go ahead and tilt this machine towards me. It's a heavy machine, so. Okay, we're draining this thing out. I've got the machine tilted towards me. This definitely isn't ideal. You can see the drain port is actually lower than the opening here in order to be able to drain the um, oil. So you gotta tilt this thing, and I suspect we're, we're, even though we're getting some of it out, we're probably definitely not gonna get all of the oil out. Now that some of the oil is drained out, I'm gonna go ahead and loosen the oil fill cap, hoping no oil comes out of there. That's to hopefully allow some air to replace the escaping oil. I'm just trying not to make a mess inside of the machine here. Okay, so this isn't all the oil. I just figured it was enough for us to get a good first look. So what do we see? Well, this oil is very dark. Like I said, this is full synthetic oil. It's extremely dark after just 15 hours. Now what I always like to do is hold a high powered light up to it. And you can see even with this high powered LED right up to that bottle, there is virtually no light coming through that oil. I mean, darn near close to none that I can tell. So you can tell this oil is very contaminated and definitely needed to be changed. And this right here, this is the oil that actually went into the machine. You can see what it started life as, this nice, beautiful, amber, clear color. And uh, what it looks like now, nothing like that. So um, I am very happy that I'm changing this oil at 15 hours. Now the last look, I have this drain bucket here. I cleaned off this center area. Let's take a peek at what this looks like going into the pan. 
just to get a final kind of overview of what this oil really looks like. So while it's going into the pan, you can see it's not the dirtiest oil I've ever seen. It's not clean, but definitely doesn't look too, too bad. So what do you guys think? Comment down below. Would you have changed your oil out of this generator at 15 hours? Or would you have waited to, I think the manual says 100 hours? I folded that drain tube back in place and I made sure that I didn't interrupt that cap since it is so easy to remove. The only thing left to do now is to remove that fill plug and fill her up. Drain plug unscrews, set that aside. I have this little funnel here. You're gonna need a funnel because there's no other way to do it. Now I'm using 5W30 fully synthetic oil. The manual calls for 10W30, but this is all I have and from my Understanding the 30 weight is the same weight, same viscosity when this oil is warmed up. The only difference being the five versus the 10, this is a little more uh, liquid in very cold temperatures. The W stands for winter. So that's my understanding. I'm going with that, but you should stick with what the manual says. Pull the funnel and then check the oil level on those threads like we were looking at before. Okay, and after the fill, looking down into that hole, you can see my oil level is right up to the threads, exactly like the manual shows, so I know that I have enough oil in the system. And then just replace the fill cap by screwing it in place. Now that I've changed the oil and confirmed that this cap is on and not accidentally fallen off, I've confirmed that my oil fill cap is screwed tight. I'm going to go ahead and put the panel back on and turn this counterclockwise in order to lock it. Now I've got the machine turned around. You can see there's no pull cord on this side. This is the other panel which is removable. We're going to take a look at the spark plug. So this side has two Phillips head screws. Go ahead and remove these. So these screws are captured so they're not going to fall out even when they're all the way loose. We can use that to kind of pull out on the panel. You just kind of Pull it, there you go, and it comes right off. And on the back side of this panel, you can see just how it's held in with these little tabs here, which simply push into these rubberized holes. Now, get a load of that. This is the engine. You can see our air filter down here, and up here, you can see our spark plug wire. Let's pull this off. Okay, and there is our spark plug. Now they do include in the box this spark plug removal tool. So I'm gonna try to use this and see just how difficult it is, or easy. We do have this rubber hose here, which is kind of in the way. Okay, let's move the spark plug wire out of the way. <clears throat> wow, this is a cold engine and that thing is really, really tight. Well, it feels tight because this is my sole source of leverage here and this isn't very much. Okay, now I can simply unscrew it by hand. have to kind of wiggle it while I'm twisting. Okay, let's see what kind of spark plug we got here. F6RTC LG. So this is the factory installed spark plug and LG. I wonder if that's the same LG we know with electronics. So looking up close, you can see the spark plug actually looks pretty good. I'm not saying the quality of the spark plug, but the actual residue on the spark plug looks really good. I don't see an issue whatsoever. Everything looks like it was burning, you know, just the way it should. So no deposits or anything built up on there. The very, very edge of that side there on the electrode looks um, like they kind of sheared it off sloppily, but what do I know? I am curious about that gap though. Let's check it. Okay, looking in the manual here again, we can see spark plug type, tells you what type and the gap should be 0.027 to 0.031. Okay, remember, this is the factory spark plug after just 15 hours of use. That gap looks pretty small to me. Yep, and that confirms it. We're probably at 0.023-ish. So definitely the gap should be way up here towards the 0.030. So the gap is way too small. From the research I've been able to do, the number one upgrade to this generator is the spark plug. So even though this spark plug looks okay and I could just gap it out to where it should be, I have noticed a very, very slight misfire every so often 
which hasn't affected the performance at all, but it's just something you can hear. I'm gonna go ahead and swap this plug out. Now what I'm gonna put in instead is an NGK BPR6ES. Now, yes, this is in a Honda packaging here, which means essentially I paid double the price for this plug that I should have, but it was what was in front of me at the store at the moment, and I just didn't have time to make another run to another auto parts store to try to find one of these plugs, so I bought it. But rest assured, this will probably live in this machine for a very, very long time, so even though I paid double the price, uh, it's fine. Now looking very close at the electrode on this NGK plug, you can see just how crisp and precise that is. That is a very good looking plug. So what is this NGK plug at out of the box? We are at almost 0 0.025. We need to open it up just a little bit. Ooh, that seems about perfect right there. So there's my gap, about 0 0.029. Just gonna wiggle it while I twist. This is just finger tight right now. So let's see how tight we're gonna go. It does have a crush washer on it. Okay. I think that's good right there. So actually looking inside the spark plug boot, it doesn't look like there's gonna be any sort of big click like I normally hear with my vehicles. This looks like it might just be kind of like a press fit. I do have it lined up. Let's see if I just give it a good push. I think that's it. Now the very last thing I'm gonna do is behind this panel here, you can see we have a battery, but from the factory, it does not come hooked up. This battery is used for the electronic starter, which you can see the switch here. Theoretically, all you do is hit this start switch without having to pull the cord. So let's take this battery out and see how to hook it up. Okay, we have a rubber strap here, which has a handle. I'm gonna pull down on it, which undoes the hook. Okay, there we go. Let's see here. All right, look how skinny that battery is. Let's get this hardware off of here, which is just some nuts and bolts and washers. So it looks like the battery is a 12 volt, six amp hour sealed lead acid battery, non-spillable. Harborfreight.com, it says right there at the very bottom. Okay, so we have these rubberized covers here. You can see it's also still red there, so we know which one is positive, but it also has a positive symbol there and a negative symbol there. This side is black, this side is red. And it does look like we get some extra slack here. I just pulled these wires a little bit and they came out quite a bit. So you can see we do have some slack to do this right in front of the machine. So inside we just have a simple ring style terminal. All right, now that I have the battery hooked up on both terminals, these little caps here don't really fit all that good. Um, I did what I am assuming you're supposed to do. You slide that kind of rectangular nut in there and I'm attaching both terminals to the top post because that seemed to be where the screw could fit through the easiest. I'm thinking this is the way they want you to do it. I'm gonna go ahead and slide everything back into place. I'm going to go ahead and pull this strap down and hook it to the little area on the bottom there. Go ahead and put the door back on. And with that, this generator now has a push to start feature. You can see right here it says starter. We already moved this to the choke position, so why don't we go ahead and give it a start using the button here. All right. Go ahead and move this over to the run position while it's kicking like that. And the machine is now running and it definitely sounds good, but I wouldn't say it sounds any better or different than it sounded before. It sounds just the same, which is nice and smooth and quiet. Let's turn on the ESC throttle. Now it's throttled way down because it doesn't need to produce that much power. I will say when it's at the slower throttle, it definitely has a little more vibration than when it's at the faster throttle, but that kind of makes sense. 
So right after I did start it up, I did hear that slight misfire probably two or three times, but I haven't heard it yet for the last minute or so. Okay, I have here what I think is a pretty good test. We have an air compressor hooked up. This is a Makita MAC 700. It's a two horsepower, 2.6 gallon compressor. This is their big bore compressor, which has, I guess, a larger piston and everything. So I'm wondering if this is a little bit more difficult to get going from something like this. So it still has that ESC throttle enabled. So this is throttled way down right now because it's not needing to produce anything. I'm really, really curious what's gonna happen when I kick on this compressor. So let's try it. Okay, this switch right here on the side is, I'm gonna push it down and that's gonna kick it on. So here we go. I can't tell you really what I just heard, but something ramped way up, which I'm assuming is the generator. The compressor seems to be running just like normal, filling up with air. Yep, everything's working good. All right, and then you heard the compressor kick off, and then this thing throttled way down. Now, I'm not 100% sure that you're supposed to have that ESC throttle feature on with something like this, but it can't be really any different than a refrigerator or an air conditioner on an RV or something like that. So maybe, maybe that's totally fine, but anyhow, it handled it just fine. Okay, I just took that ESC switch off, so this is at the full throttle setting, and I have started to hear that slight misfire. Hopefully you heard those just now. There was three of them in a row. Okay, well I just turned it off. And hopefully you were able to hear some of those very slight misfires, but they do seem to happen quite often actually. We do have a really good plug in there, so we can confirm that it wasn't the plug that was the issue. So I'm starting to wonder either if there's an issue with the machine itself or potentially even the fuel that's in it. I do buy all my fuel from very good stations that are high volume, so I know that it should be as good as it gets. It is only 87 octane though, maybe I need to put in 89. And so there you go, the Harbor Freight Predator 3500 inverter generator. I hope you got something out of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up. It always helps this video and the channel. And don't forget to comment down below with your thoughts and ideas about this generator in particular, if you own one, what sort of issues you may have had, or is it working out beautifully for you? Let us all know down in the comment section below. For me, I think I'm okay with that slight misfire. Everything seems to be working okay. Of course, it is brand new with only 16 hours on it now, and I've only ran my meat freezer and now that compressor. So, so far, it's been able to put out the power I've needed, and it seems to be pretty fuel efficient as well. I guess I'm happy with it. I wish it didn't have that slight misfire. I would like to know if some of you guys have experienced the same thing. But other than that, again, hope you enjoyed this video. I'm Jimmy for One Road, and I will see you in the next one.